In this video, I'd like to build on what we've been doing the last couple lectures and learning about uh, hierarchical models <clears throat> and random effects and think about how we might apply these concepts in practice uh, by looking at how to implement some of these models within JAX. Uh, my general suggestion for any sort of hierarchical model or any more complex Bayesian model in general is this mantra here of, of starting simple and progressively adding complexity. So always start with a, a simple model that might violate uh, various assumptions uh, rather than throwing a model that has all possible bells and whistles at the data. Um, that way you can get something working and you can verify that you're able to get the model to run and to converge. Uh, and then you can add uh, complexity uh, incrementally and by adding that that complexity incrementally um, if you reach a point where your code stops working either it crashes or fails to converge you understand what additional factors was were the ones that that pushed the code too far or, or where the bug in the code is um, rather than writing you know if you start from a very complicated model and it doesn't work it can be very challenging to figure out why it didn't work so <clears throat> so think about this in practice. Uh, consider an example uh, similar to the one that we looked at uh, earlier in terms of thinking about uh, partitioning random variability, where here I've got a time series of biomass uh, for different observational units that are organized by block. Block is represented by color here, uh, and they vary over time. So I have uh, I believe I have five blocks, five observations per block, and, and a total of 10 uh, years. So if we think about how we might model this hierarchically, we have the possibility of thinking about a block effect. We have the possibility of thinking about a year effect, a time effect. And we can also think about having both block and time uh, <clears throat> at, at the same time. Uh, but rather than to dive into that full model, let's start with the simplest model to build off of, which is a model that just looks at uh, the global mean. So here uh, we have uh, down in the likelihood, you know, X are observed data for a specific time, block an individual is normally distributed with mean mu and uh, precision sigma. And then we put a prior on that mu and sigma. Uh, the only difference between this and the, the mean model that we've looked at before is just in this case, I happen to have organized the data in an array by time, block, and individual. Um, <clears throat> that said, uh, I, I do want to point out at this point that while I'm going to keep this data organization, this data structure here in terms of time, block, and individual uh, in order to implement the, the random effects for time and block, I will also say that in practice, uh, frequently I do not organize data in this sort of an array, but more have it in terms of a table where I might have indices indicating time, block, or individual, and I will end up using those indices uh, within uh, a particular random effect, but just have an overall loop over all observations. So that's the other way of implementing these sorts of models, which is similar to what we had before, where we just had a loop over all individuals and we just had this normal error uh, with the mean invariance. If we fit that model, we can see we get a, a nice tight confidence interval. Uh, we have a nice wide predictive interval, and you know we don't really explain any variability over time because there isn't any time effect. We don't explain any variability from block to block because there isn't any sort of block effect. Uh, next, what I'm going to do is thinking about adding this random time effect. So first thing that's going to happen is we're going to add a process model that's a little bit more complicated. Uh, now, the expected value <clears throat> at a particular time is going to depend on a overall global mean mu and a, a time random effect, so this alpha t indexed for a specific time. And we're going to loop over those different times. Uh, but in this case, uh, Within that particular time, we can then loop over block and individual because those aren't the expected value isn't changing with those. 
uh, as before, we have a prior on mu, we have a prior in sigma, but now uh, we also need to have a parameter model on that alpha. So up here, we have a loop over time where we put uh, you know, this parameter model that says this alpha t is normally distributed with mean zero and a precision tau t. And then we need to have a prior on that tau t because it's going to be an estimated variable. So that tau t precision has an uninformative gamma prior here. And remember that our, our mean for any random effect model is going to be zero. Uh, when we fit this model, we now have uh, confidence intervals, uh, means and confidence intervals that are varying from year to year uh, because we have not just an overall mean, but we have a, an estimate of year to year variability uh, because we're now fitting a mean and 10 year effects. Our confidence intervals are wider because we're now estimating more parameters. Uh, our predictive intervals are actually fairly similar, uh, but now show this year-to-year -year variability that kind of matches uh, you know, the, you know, the years that seem to be high years and the years that seem to be low years. Um, alternatively, I could have written the code in a very similar way to capture the block effect. So now uh, as I index over the different blocks, the expected value changes based on block an overall mean and an alpha b for block. Um, and then I have uh, a parameter model for that random block effect. So b is looping over the number of blocks and the alpha b is normally attributed with mean zero and some tau b. And that tau b, that precision, has an uninformative gamma prior in this case. I'm not showing confidence intervals here just for the sake of visual cl clarity, but you can see the estimates of the mean uh, now vary by block. There's not a year effect in this model, so we only see the consistent differences from block to block. So we have two blocks, uh, the black and the cyan, that tend to be high. We have two blocks, the green and the blue, that tend to be low. And we have a red block that tends to be in the middle. Um, so we're capturing those consistent differences from block to block that you know, may be associated with some explanatory variable, but we don't know what that variable is at this point in time. And then in this fourth model, uh, we've now combined the random time and block effect, which really shows the strength of this random effect structure, because now I can write down the expected value uh, is changing by both time and block, according to some global mean and some alpha B block effect and an alpha t time effect. Um, and then I have to have parameter models on both the alpha b block effect and a parameter model on the alpha t time effect. Both are mean zero with precisions tau b and tau t. And then we need to have priors on those uh, precisions. So now as I, if I were to fit this model, uh, which I'm not going to visualize because it would have both year-to-year -year variability and block-to-block -block variability. Uh, one of the things you're seeing is that, you know, when I started out, I just had one overall sigma for the overall variability. I then partitioned that into uh, sigma and either a time effect or a block effect. And now I have a sigma, a, a time effect, and a block effect. So I actually have three different estimates of variance that I've partitioned the variability into a, a temporal variability, block variability, and overall kind of residual, remaining residual variability. Uh, this table summarizes the results from those different models. Uh, we can see that in all the models, we end up with a estimate of the, the global mean, that the, those estimates don't change much uh, from model to model. Uh, we do see, though, that the uncertainty in that global mean uh, does increase as we increase the complexity of the model. Uh, at the same time, our, our estimate of sigma, in this case, it's been converted into uh, standard deviation. So this is our, our residual error. Uh, our estimate of the residual error uh, gets more and more confident uh, as we add complexity to the model. So you know, with, um, with both the time and block random effects, uh, the residual uncertainty is, is a good bit lower you know, maybe 
uh, close to a quarter what it originally was. Uh, and we've partitioned that uncertainty out. So we can see that, you know, first in the random time effect, we partitioned it into a, a residual and a time variability. In the block effect, we partitioned it into a residual and block variability. And in the final model, we partitioned that out into a residual error, a temporal variability, and a block variability. Uh, and I've then calculated the DIC for all of these models, uh, showing that as I added these random effects, even though the process model ultimately is just a mean uh, that we are, are capturing variability successfully, that, that, that accounting for this block and time variability is the more parsimonious uh, solution uh, to fitting this model to the data. The other thing worth noting here is that we actually learn things by this partitioning. You know, for example, in this case, we, we've partitioned things into residual error, uh, temporal variability, and block variability. We see that the, the temporal variability uh, is actually the largest source of variability in the overall model. Um, that would suggest that uh, if I were to start adding additional covariates to this model, you know, the first thing I might want to do is ask, you know, what might be causing uh, the year-to-year -year variability, because that's the variability that I most need to explain. Uh, that said, the block-to-block -block and residual variability are, are non-negligible as well, so you, you would also, in this particular case, where they aren't wildly different, uh, there would be an argument for investing time in, in trying to explain what factors are associated with the block-to-block -block variability and the, uh, the residu residual error. Uh, so I guess this is to point out that the idea of uh, random effects are not, is not exclusive from adding uh, explanatory processes to, to help us explain where the variability is, but it's often a, a helpful stepping stone uh, to understand where the dominant scales of variability are.